Okay. You know, I'm going to try to make this as concise as possible. And we're going to talk about Tesla's perfect analogy, and it really is a pretty perfect analogy, on the ether. Yeah, because, of course, we all know, as I told you in a video from a week ago, that, I, that uh, Nikola Tesla called Einstein a fuzzy-haired crackpot and a beggar dressed like a king for his reification of bent space. And, of course, bent space is absolutely impossible because, as Nikola Tesla accurately said, Space has attributes, but it has no properties. Um, specifically, uh, Nikola Tesla said that uh, the notion uh, that, uh, say that the presence of large bodies, space becomes curved, is equivalent to stating that something, i.e. the matter, can act upon nothing, which is space. And analogously, by the way, space is absolutely no different than a shadow. A shadow is not a thing. Of course, it's a noun in our dictionary, but a uh, shadow, of course, is an absence of light. It's not a thing. It has no principality. It can't act on anything. It actually has, of course, attributes, but no properties. An attribute, of course, would be like if you stand in a shadow, you're going to feel colder than if you were not standing in a shadow, but a space has no properties. By the way, space is not a thing, and time is only a measure of magnitudes. There's no such thing as space and time. Ultimately, space is literally the after effect of a centrifugal divergent magnetic field. It is the after effect, and this is what the ancient Greeks and Indians uh, meant when they said over and over and over again, this neat little ditty, they said, when this is present, then that is present. When this is not present, then that is not present. But space, accurately from Nikola Tesla, is that it has no properties. But I already talked about endlessly uh, what uh, Tesla said about Einstein and his quackery. And it is quackery. And by the way, the halfway intelligent things that Einstein wrote and talked about were stolen. And believe it or not, there are three books on this topic proving it, literally proving it, that uh, Einstein stole his stuff from Henri Poincaré. That would be H-E-N-R-I Poincaré, P-O-I-N-C-A-R-E, Henri Poincaré. Look him up if you don't believe me. Several books on that topic. But let's get now on to... Uh, uh, Nikola Tesla on the ether, and then we're going to explain it very, very briefly in a very simplex analogy that I think you'll be able to understand. Here's Nikola Tesla's quote. He said that there is no energy in matter other than that it receives uh, from the environment. And by environment, Nikola Tesla is referring to the ether. He's referring to the environment, uh, the, the topos, the, uh, the Cartesian and non-Cartesian point source for all matter and mass, but let's get on to the, the key the discussions about the ether. Here's Nikola Tesla again. He said that, that, that no theory could explain the workings of the universe without recognizing the existence of the ether and the indispensable function it plays in uh, phenomena. But let's get on to an, uh, the uh, important quote from uh, Nikola Tesla. And this one is, I forget, 19... 1921 quote. I don't actually have the quote attached to this one. The point, the point source, uh, the source reference for this one. But anyway, this is Nikola Tesla speaking. So there's something frightening about the universe when we consider that only our senses of sound and sight make it beautiful. The universe is darker than the darkest ink, colder than the coldest ice, and more silent than a silent tomb. Sight and sound are our only avenues through which we can perceive it all. There is a third sense which is we have uh, failed to discover. The fascination of the uh, false electromagnetic theory of light uh, advanced by Maxwell and subsequently experimentally investigated by Hertz was so great that even now, although uh, controverted, uh, the uh, foolish, as he means, idiotic scientific minds are under its sway. This uh, crazy theory supposes that the existence of a medium, which was solid yet uh, permitted bodies, pass through it without resistance. He's actually talking about a, a false, uh, tenuous uh, conception. Let's get on uh, to the important part here where he draws the light analogy and talking about the ether. Tesla states that light was wrongly considered to be such a phenomena bound up in uh, that uh, medium, uh, like transverse uh, vibrations in a solid. He said, what then, this is the important part from Nikola Tesla, what then can light be if not a transverse vibration. I consider this extremely important. Light cannot be anything but a longitudinal disturbance in the ether involving alternating compressions and rarefactions. Light can uh, be nothing else than a sound wave in the ether. He doesn't literally mean sound. He's talking about the analogy of sound relative to oxygen and nitrogen, which is what sound is. Sound doesn't have a speed either. Sure it does. Everybody knows what the sound barrier is. No. 
Sound doesn't have a speed either. I'll get to that very, very quickly after I get done quoting, quoting Tesla here. Um, but neither does light have a speed. Sure, everybody knows what the speed of light is. No, 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 that's not true. We'll get onto that very quickly. Um, there's, of course, a lot of different crazy theories about the ether use, uh, disproving the Maxwellian ether. Um, and Nikola Tesla continues, the Newtonian theory is an error because it fa fails entirely in not being able to explain how a small candle uh, can project light uh, with the same speed as the blazing sun. This is the retroductive analysis going on in Nikola Tesla's head, which has uh, immensely higher temperatures and power, of course. We have made sure by experiment that light propagates with the same velocity, irrespective of the character of the source. In other words, a candle, even though this is not a candle, this is a, a screen on my iMac here, or still light... Uh, and light is an ether perturbation modality, of course. Same as uh, dielectricity and same as magnetism. Of course, it's propagating uh, of the ether, you know, and it's registering on the back of my eyes and it's registering to your eyes. But, I mean, obviously there's extremely little power involved uh, in this, uh, this light generation. But, I mean, it's still no different than that emitted by the sun or any other super powerful source wherein, by which a light is emitted. Um, in respect to the curves, such consistency of velocity, as Nikola Tesla says, can only be explained by assuming that it is dependent solely on the physical properties of the ether, especially in its density and uh, elastic force. And this, of course, is where Tesla wanders down the rabbit hole in uh, discussing, uh, you know, and formulating his perfect analogy of the ether. He calls it like a sound wave. Uh, uh, you know, sound wave in the ether. This is exactly what Nikola Tesla says. That uh, light can be nothing else other than a sound wave in the ether. But let's just take a look at uh, sound. Sound doesn't have a speed either. You know, nothing is moving. You know, when I talk, of course, it hits the microphone. But there's, 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 you know, I'm not emitting anything. What I'm actually doing is causing a perturbation, a disturbance, kind of like a person in the middle of a pond flapping their arms and causing perturbations in the water, creating waves. I'm actually causing rarefactions and compressions at certain frequencies and certain magnitudes in the nitrogen and oxygen. It obviously makes up the air that is being registered by the microphone and recorded by my, my uh, you know, digital camera recording device. Sound is not an emission. It's a disturbance. Nothing is moving. Well, what is, you know, the so-called speed of sound? You know, before we talk about light, let's just make a perfect analogy. You know, what is it? It's the rate of force permeability. And, of course, if you try to, uh, and this is the reason why uh, supersonic aircraft are shaped like a needle. You know, the front of them are shaped like a needle. Needle is obviously a wake front. We're not talking about wake fronts. but And, of course, friction is built up. But uh, the rate of sound is, uh, you know, the rate of force permeability. Someone's going, you know, the aircraft's going Mach 2 or Mach 3. I mean, it's well ahead of the sound that it actually generates. You know, the aircraft is way the hell over here, but the sound is being generated or being heard in proximity, you know, way the hell back here. That's the rate of uh, force propagation, i.e. the permeability. And of course, when we're talking about field theory, you know, everything is capacitance, resistance, magnetic permeability, and dielectric permittivity. But the so-called speed of sound is the rate of force permeability of the rarefactions and compressions that, that which, by which and in which the sound is generated. Yes, perfect analogy. I mean, yes, sound does not have a speed. Something is emitting sound. Nothing emits sound. I'm not emitting anything when I talk. Nothing emits light either. If you think a light bulb emits light, then you're a fool just like everybody else on this planet. Humanity is not yet intellectually evolved enough to understand that nothing is being emitted from a light bulb or from this computer screen, for example. It's not. It's not. It's an ether perturbation modality at a set frequency, wavelength, whether it be circular polarization, linear polarization, doesn't make any difference. This is EMR, uh, electromagnetic, uh, EM EMR, electromagnetic radiation, or EMI, electromagnetic interference. This is the force permeability. I mean, we know that sound uh, is altered uh, depending on the density of the air. I mean, this is an established fact. Light has different speeds. It's not a speed at all, but we'll just use the word conventionally. It has a different speed 
it slows down by what 30 percent somewhere about so through water and uh, glass depending on the glass yeah this is not my opinion it's an established fact light doesn't have a speed because nothing is propagating from point A to point B nothing is emitting light the only way you can explain and this is why there's only two foundations of reality possibility for reality one works and the other one doesn't work at all nothing is being emitted the only reason why you actually have different rates of propagation of sound and of light depending on the medium whereby which and in which the propagation is occurring i.e. the disturbance kind of like a person in the middle of the pond you know flapping their arms let's say that the pond is halfway frozen over say a person's in the middle of a pond with like a you know super thin sheet of ice on top right yeah, then the permeability changes, right? You could actually still make waves in a pond that has a slight ice layer over it. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, this is a fact. I don't know if you've ever seen something break through really thin ice, but it makes waves too, but it's a lot slower. The rate of propagation changes because the ice, the water is more dense. The medium has changed. Yeah? When light uh, as a medium, the, the, uh, the propagation actually interacts with the glass, for example, you know, like a camera lens, yeah? The rate of induction changes. Uh, there's 13 elements in this lens. The rate of propagation changes because the medium changes. Everything's capacitance, resistance, magnetic permeability, and dielectric permittivity. The so-called uh, speed of light is not a speed at all. It doesn't change. We're just talking about the different... Uh, permeability and permittivities of the medium whereby which in which the disturbance is actually occurring. This is why Nikola Tesla said that the ether, let me quote Tesla again here, the ether can be, no, you know, the light can be nothing other than a sound wave in the ether. You know, a sound wave is, you know, a disturbance of the air. Light is a disturbance of the medium, which is not a thing. The medium is the ether. Of course, the ether has no Cartesian reality. You could say subspace, you could say zero space, you could say counter space, you could say dark energy, dark ma I don't give a damn what you call it. Mother Nature doesn't give a crap what stupid humans call it either. But Nikola Tesla's analogy is absolutely perfectly apt. Because sound is not an emission. Sound is not traveling from here to here. I am not emitting anything when I talk. I am setting up a disturbance in the medium, and that medium right here is oxygen and nitrogen. Light is exactly the same. When you flick on a light bulb, it's not propagating. It's not traveling from point A to point B. It's not emitting anything. It's a vacuum sealed little glass vessel with some argon injected to it. And, you know, the light is, of course, an uh, ether perturbation is being emitted through the capacitance, resistance, and permeability of the uh, tungsten carbide coil of, you know, like a conventional light bulb. Of course, LED light source is why LEDs, by the way, are so bad for your eyes because they're point source light. They're not perfect point source light, like a laser, but they are point source light. This is why LEDs are bad for your eyes, but that's completely off topic. But uh, we all grew up with this crazy nonsense that light is an emission, light has a speed, light is moving from point A to point B. And even crazier than that, you know, light is composed of photons. An arbitrary concept with no basis in reality is purely conceptual fabrication in the minds of atomists. There are only two foundations of reality ever proposed throughout the entire history of the world. This ignorant little world that we're all living on, this little blue marble. Only two, and there are only, and one is completely implausible and nonsensical. The only two foundations for reality, one is based upon atomism. Mother Nature is a crazy hooker on crack with a bag of bumping particles. It can't explain anything. It can't explain instantaneous action at a distance. It can't explain the phenomena of light. can't explain the double slit experiment. can't explain anything. And the other foundation is the ether. And no, the Michelson-Morley experiment did not disprove the ether. I need to make a... I mean, I've already made like five videos on it. People steep begging me to talk about that idiotic Michelson Morley experiment. Well, that disproved the ether. No, it didn't. Did no such thing. But there has only ever been these two postulations for the foundation of reality. One is atomism, which is completely untenable, illogical, nonsensical, and doesn't explain observed phenomena. And then we have something divinely simple, uh, fits perfectly within Occam's razor, explains every observed phenomena in nature that we've ever seen, ever. This is the only foundation of reality the ether not atomism this bumping particle 
messenger particle, virtual photon, virtual, by the way, virtual fo particles and photons, which is what these idiots in quantum say mediate out uh, magnetism and other things. They, there have never been the input or output of any experiment ever drawn. They're arbitrarily, uh, they're an arbitrary conception with no basis in reality. They have, this is why Einstein called these people fuzzy-haired crackpots. He also called them metaphysicians rather than scientists. Quote, unquote, from Nikola Tesla about the quantum idiots. These people are not scientists. They are metaphysicians. When he actually impugned metaphysicians, since I am a metaphysician, he was literally meaning is that these people were creating uh, fanciful uh, realities based upon arbitrary brain fart conceptions in their heads, like photons and virtual particles and messenger particles. And they even like, got gravitons, like, you know, what's going on in gravity is gravitons. It's ridiculous. Completely ridiculous. No basis in reality. Unbelievable science fiction BS. And it's not science at all. Anyway, I've talked a lot tonight. I'm going to end it there. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you liked this video. And you go a lot further down the rabbit hole if you bear with me. It, uh, it's been a busy week. If you like these videos, please click the link below. Tell me how much you can't stand me. Tell me how much you hate me, especially if you're, if you're uh, in the cult of quantum. Make sure you tell me how much you can't stand me. I hate you. Einstein was right. Yeah, sure he was. Sure he was. <laughs> okay. Uh, go back to your Dr. Seuss book. Bye. Mic drop.